going to begin reading at verse number one. The word of the Lord says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And I'm going to go back to verse number one. How lovely is your dwelling place. How many want to dwell in the house of the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah for the word of the Lord is blessed. Our hospitality committees want to come up and give us our welcome on this afternoon. And followed by that, we're going to ask if someone from Mount Zion is going to point to give us a response for the welcome. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Everyone this morning, praise the Lord. On the behalf of our pastor and New Fellowship Baptist Church of South Philly, I would like to welcome Reverend Wright and his congregation this afternoon from Love Zion Baptist Church. We want to thank y'all for coming out celebrating with us this morning. And may we all get a blessing from the word this afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon again, New Fellowship. Um, it's a blessing by God to be in the house of the Lord one more time. We count it not a robbery to, to come out and we don't take for granted the invitation. We, um, um, on behalf of Love Zion Baptist Church, our Pastor Clarence E. Wright, we want to extend a, a warm congratulation. Well, Pastor, I'm you celebrating your third anniversary. That is a blessing by God. Amen. God has planted a seed in this part of Philadelphia and you guys are doing a great work because you are lifting up the name of Jesus. Um, it's not by happenstance that we sung Lift Him Up. We sung that same hymn this morning in North Philly. So the same Holy Spirit that's working on 23rd Street is the same God and the same Holy Spirit that's working on 19th and Federal. So we thank God for this opportunity to come and worship uh, for a first time, but hopefully it won't be a last. Amen. 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 We're going to call upon the choir from Love Zion that's going to come render us a few selections on this evening. <laughs> of course, that's subject to change according to the Holy Spirit.
bless me by. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to ask at this time if everybody will stand to, the, to their feet as we present the pastor of this house. None other than our pastor joins, and he's going to lead us further into the service. Amen. 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 Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord is worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we do give honor to the Spirit of Christ that rests and rule and abide in this place. Uh, to my friend and my brother, Pastor Amen. Clarence E. Wright, uh, Pastor of the Love Zion Church, and to officials of both churches, and to you, my brothers and my sisters, we say good afternoon. Amen. 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 Uh, we are so thankful and grateful uh, that the Lord has blessed us once again to come to his house just to give him the praise for the great things he has done. Amen. And the fact that I see you sitting in front of me this afternoon lets me know that the Lord is still in the blessing business. Amen. 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 Uh, I come before you now. I don't want to uh, belabor the hour because I know uh, that around 640 that a lot of us need to be in front of the TV. Amen. Amen. To uh, uh, witness what the Lord will do. Amen. In the life of those who bleed green. Amen. And 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 and, and uh, I want to let uh, uh, one of members of our house know uh, that just so happens to be a Cowboys fan. Amen. <laughs> we got a couple of them in here. Amen. Uh, that the Lord is working on our side, amen, and working for such a time as this. You've had your time, <laughs> but what, what, what God has for us, <laughs> amen, it is for us, amen, amen, so good to, to come together and have uh, fun in church, amen, and if we can't have fun with the Lord, uh, then, uh, then uh, where can we have good, clean fun? Amen. Amen. But nevertheless, uh, I've come to introduce uh, uh, a brother, a friend uh, that uh, I have grown to love in the uh, short time that I have known him. Uh, I did not know him until uh, we both started uh, to serve on the music ministry uh, for... Uh, our ministers conference, the wow. Baptist and Pastors Ministers Conference of uh, Philadelphia and Vicinity. Uh, I came to meet him and, and came to find out that he is a great musician. Amen. And uh, that we also uh, shared something in common that we both served as the minister of music of our churches before we exceeded to become the pastor. Amen. Amen. Uh, and uh, we do thank and praise God for uh, his friendship and for what he has done uh, through the friendship that we have shared. Uh, I heard him preach the first for the first time at one of our conference sessions, and I said to him, "Brother, you will be down <laughs> to South Philly to to, to share." a word with us, and he, he uh, was very, very humble. Uh, a lot of times, you know, um, when we meet preachers, us preachers, uh, when we think that we are the be-all to end-all, <laughs> that we can become some arrogant something. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But it's so great uh, to find a brother um, that is humble, uh, for we know that the Lord said that meek and humble is the way. Amen. Amen. So we praise God for his humble spirit. We praise God uh, also for his willingness to come and to share with us today. And I know that this brother can preach. Amen. I know that he will preach. Amen. Uh, I was uh, sharing with him in the office. I said, uh, uh, the people of New Fellowship, um, they have come accustomed to 
uh, hearing a word. Oh, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot, a lot of us are brought up in the church and we know there's a lot of theatrics that go along uh, with preaching. I said, but we, we might like a hoop and a holler sometime, but we got to say something first. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But I know that this brother, uh, he is a, a student of the word of God. He is well learned. He uh, is currently enrolled in the doctoral program at the Colgate Rochester uh, Seminary uh, in Rochester, New York. Yes. We praise God for that. And he is also uh, the newly elected uh, second vice president of the Baptist Pastor yeah. Genesis Conference of Philadelphia and by Sanity. Uh, so my brothers and sisters, to you uh, that do not know him, I will introduce. And to you that do know him, I will present none other than the esteemed pastor of the Love Zion Baptist Church, uh, the, that and the person of the Reverend Clarence E. Wright. Hear ye him as he comes. Amen? Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask your choir to come back. He said, yeah, 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 one more song. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, the after the Love Zion Choir has come back uh, to lead us in praise uh, with another selection, uh, then the next voice you will hear will be that of their pastor, Pastor Wright. Amen. 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 Her hands
on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, lift up the praise in this house. If he's done nothing else, I think he saved your soul, didn't he? Probably skipping to the end of the sermon, but you know he did die on the cross and he rose again. So we ought to give him praise. So come on, let's put our hands together. Let's open up our mouths. Let's shout hallelujah. of all of our praise. Amen. It is a blessing to be in the house. Lord, one more time, thank you for our music ministry. Thank you. Uh, and to the praise team from this great church, thank you so much for setting the atmosphere. And uh, help me to celebrate uh, the great pastor of this house, pastor of three years, Pastor Batman Goins. Bless you. It's a blessing and a privilege to, uh, to stand before you today at this great time of celebration. Amen. Uh, the game starts at 640. So uh, I have uh, two and a half hours to preach. I promise I'll only use two hours and 15 minutes. So you can get, get to your little foosball game. <laughs> I told your pastor in the, in the office that I picked the wrong season to boycott the NFL. And uh, I'm not going to watch tonight. I haven't watched all season. I'm not going to watch tonight. Um, but if they win tonight, I'm going to go into my prayer closet. And I'm going to fast and lay in sackcloth and ashes and see if the Lord would release me from this boycott. So y'all pray for me. Amen. Look with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew. Matthew uh, chapter 9. And we're going to straddle chapters today. Uh, we're going to go from Matthew 9, 37. Read the last two verses of Matthew 9 and the first verse of Matthew 10. Matthew 9, 37 through Matthew 10, 1. And I am going to be reading out of the NIV translation for your hearing today. Whatever version of the Bible you have, uh, you can follow along uh, and let the Spirit lead. Matthew 9, 37 through 10, 1. Thank you to our musicians. Zach and John, thank you so much for your service. Matthew 9, 37 to 10, 1. This is what the word of the Lord says. It says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Verse 1 of chapter 10 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. I just want to reiterate that first, verse 37, which says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I'm going to speak for the next few minutes from the subject, The Headache in the Harvest. The Headache in the Harvest. Do me a favor, just look at the person next to you. I promise I won't have you slapping your neighbor the whole sermon. But if you would just look at the person next to you and just say those words. Say the headache in the harvest. Look at somebody else. Say the headache in the harvest. Get one more person and I promise I'll leave you alone. But just say the headache in the harvest. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, deacons. You can be seated. To reap a harvest has become part of our metaphoric vernacular uh, in dealing with issues of the spirit and of ministry in general. By the saying, but the saying to reap has become so common that we really don't understand what it means to reap. Although we have a few holdovers from down south among us, one of which is giving me my best amens today. Uh, most of us 
in here, I would be willing to guess, are actually uh, not from the farm, but we're city dwellers. Yeah. With a few suburbanites mixed in. Some of us are from North Philly. Some of us are from South Philly. A few of us snuck in from Jersey or the surrounding counties. But whether you're from 19th and Federal or Upper Darby, chances are you don't lead an agricultural life. Even those of you who were raised on a farm have since adapted your lives to this concrete jungle that we call Philadelphia. I don't know about you, but when I want eggs, uh, I go to the grocery store, not the hen house. I wish I had a witness in here today. Uh, I, I, I might mess with somebody right now, but uh, 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 you don't have to raise your hand, but I know of some folk in here who still smoke cigarettes. Those of you who still smoke, first of all, I'm praying for your deliverance. Second, I'm guessing that when you smoke, uh, you, you go to the store and get a pack of Newports. You don't have to put your knees in the North Carolina soil. You don't have to cut the tobacco plants. You don't have to remove the leaves and the stalk. You don't have to hang the leaves and wait for the tobacco to age. Every time you need a smoke, you just go to the store. Somebody has already done all of that for you. All you got to do is tell them what your brand is. So when we say reap a harvest, it's not literal to us. So people are under the misconception that the word reap means to receive. When really, reap means to work. We've heard so many name it and claim it word of faith messages about seed time and harvest that we're under the misconception that sowing a seed is the hard part. And the harvest is the blessing at the end. But in reality, the harvest is when you do your hardest work. The word reap doesn't just mean receive as if it's going to fall out of the sky. Reap means literally to cut with a sickle or a reaping machine. To reap means to dig, to gather up, to pluck up. To reap means to get down in the dirt and wrestle with the crop that you planted so that ultimately it can become something useful. To reap is to work, and the harvest is the season that you do the work. Not only is it the season when you do the work, but the harvest is the result of the work that you have done. So now we should understand what Jesus means when he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus is saying the season for the harvest is right now. Jesus is saying the results are there for the taking, but first you have to reap. First you have to work. And while there are a whole lot of people who want to receive the benefits of the harvest, there are not many who want to do the work of reaping. Because there is a headache in the harvest. Remember why Jesus said this. He had gone through all the towns and villages. He taught in the synagogues and he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom in the streets. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed crowds with thousands of hungry people. He dealt with Pharisees and tax collectors and lepers and prostitutes and important people and outcasts. And he kept seeing these crowds of harassed and helpless people wandering like sheep without a shepherd. And it hurt his heart because in that moment, Jesus felt the limitations of his humanity. In his spiritual form with the Father, he can do everything and be everywhere. I know you were taught in Sunday school that God is omnipotent and omniscient. He knows everything and he sees everything and he's everywhere. But by taking on human flesh for 33 years, Jesus was willfully taking on human limitations. He who was almighty 
and omnipotent took on the frustration of not being able to do it all at once. We always talk about how nothing is impossible with God, but we don't like to talk about the inherent limitations of taking on human flesh. Despite all of the miracles that he was able to perform, that he did perform, despite all the sick that he did heal, despite all the sheep that he was able to shepherd, he couldn't do it all while wrapped in human flesh. So he empowered his disciples to duplicate the work that he did. Because when the plentiful harvest, uh, what the plentiful harvest needed was more workers. And can I tell you something? Even if he could do it all himself, that would be of no value to us. He was fully man, willfully. I know we, we talk about him being God. I'm preaching to a crowd that knows Jesus is God. Uh, listen, if you don't know Jesus is divine, let's talk afterward. Because I'm going to lead you to the throne. Amen, somebody. So we know Jesus is God. We talk about that, all right? The problem is we don't acknowledge that he was also a human being. He was all man. I know it's bad math, but he was all man. And he was all God. He was 100% man. And somehow he was still 100%. but he was fully God naturally so if he wanted to do it all by himself he could have but that wouldn't help us let me say it this way let me say it this way it's the pastor's anniversary uh, your pastor can do every job in this church I know him he's a gifted man he's a talented man he can do every job in this church from the door to the pulpit he, he can preach he can preside he can pray he can sing he can play the keyboard he can take the offering he can count the offering if he needed to he could usher he can run the soundboard he can lead ministries your pastor can do it all he can do it all but he can't do it all at the same time and it would prevent other people from walking in their gifts and callings. So if pastor is trying to, listen, I, know I, I sampled some of your cuisine, so I know y'all got some good cooks in this church. Now, now, now pastor, he can try to cook if he wanted to, uh, and while he's preaching, and, and while he's serving, while he's visiting the sick, he could do it all, but not all at once. And even if he could do it all, that would block you from doing what God has called you to do. So God had to say, listen, I need you to focus on one thing because I've got to raise some other people up to do some other things. i got some gifts and talents. i got to put in some other people. If he tried to do it all, he would be limited and he would be limiting you at the same time. I took, it took me a while to learn, and I'm still learning, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. I wish I had some help in this house today. Jesus, as a shepherd, understood that for the full harvest to come forward, he needed to gather workers who would do the same work that he did. Can I tell you something today? We are those workers that he has gathered. How does verse 37 begin? It says, then he said to his disciples, let me remind you that we are his disciples. We are the workers. We are the ones who are called to reap the harvest planted by the seed of his blood. But the workers are few. So in verse 38, Jesus gives a simple instruction that we pray. And he doesn't just say that we pray for anything. He says specifically, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. God has already prepared the harvest. God has already planted the seeds. He already watered the field. He already caused the sunshine to shine on the crops. The field is ready. God has already prepared the hearts of those we will speak to and he will give us the words that we need to say. But our prayer is not just for him to send us out. Our prayer is that the ones we minister to, that they be sent out as well. My goal 
is not just to be disciples. Our goal is to make disciples. So we do the work of reaping to gather a harvest of disciples who themselves repeat the process. But be careful what you pray for because there is a headache in the harvest. Verse 1 in chapter 10 shows us the results of what Jesus instructed the disciples to pray. In the last verse of chapter 9, it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Can we just live here for a minute? Notice that Jesus called the disciples to himself before he sent them out. You can't be sent out until you are first drawn in. So he called the disciples to him and he gave them authority. Let's back this up for a minute. So, so, so Jesus ministered to the towns and villages. Jesus proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and healed their diseases. He had compassion on them like a shepherd with his sheep. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Then he told his disciples, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So he was already speaking to his disciples. Now think about the significance of Jesus calling his 12 disciples to him when they were already speaking with him. He was already speaking to them and he told them, come to me. Think about that for a minute. That means he didn't call them from a distance uh -oh. so that he could speak to them. Yeah. They weren't way across the field. Yeah. They weren't on the other side of the Galilee Lake. Yeah. They, 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 they weren't way around the corner somewhere. Yeah. They weren't even at the end of the sanctuary when he was on this side. Yeah. It said they were talking to him already. Yeah. That means he didn't call him from a distance. He was already speaking to them. Yeah. They were already in his presence uh -huh. and he just called them closer. Can I tell you, Love Zion and New Fellowship, uh -huh. that in this season, God is calling us closer yeah. to him. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is saying, I know you're here, yeah. and you hear me speaking to you, well, well. but I need you to come closer. Yeah. And that really ought to be our prayer. God, bring us closer to you. I can hear the hymn writer say, draw me near, near a precious Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. It's not enough to hear him speaking. I need to be close enough to touch his presence. I need to be close enough for him to lay hands on me. Because that's where the power comes from. So even though his disciples were already gathered around him, verse 1 says, he called them to him. But look at what he does next. It says he gave them authority. If you want to know, uh, uh, or rather if you want authority, uh, you have to give it from someone who has the authority to give authority. It's one thing to have authority. Everyone who has authority is not able to give authority unto someone else. But because Jesus has so much authority, he had a supreme authority that allowed him to give his authority unto somebody else. If you want the authority to act on behalf of Jesus, you can only get that authority from Jesus himself. You can't be sent out until you are first drawn in. But if you come close to him, he will give you authority. The question is, authority... For what? I need to help somebody today because I think we've gotten misconstrued the kind of authority that we have. There's a whole lot of folk who've been walking around in authority that God never gave to us. Uh, I don't know how hard I should be walking on this Sunday afternoon, but, but if you think you have the authority to call those things that are not as though they are, I need you to look at that text again because it says that God has the authority to call those things 
things that are not as though they are, but we have taken that authority unto ourselves. Uh, authority for what? Well, it's in the text. The text says he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. Hear me now. To drive out impure spirits, you have to be around impure spirits. Can I help somebody today? To heal every disease and sickness, you have to be around some sick people with some diseases. Did I mention that there is a headache in the harvest? See, ministry is meant to be messy. Can, can I go deeper? If your ministry is clean and orderly and predictable, you're probably not doing ministry. If your ministry only involves catering to people who already know Jesus and already know how to do church, then you're probably not doing ministry. Real ministry means you have to deal with people who have never been to church. Real ministry means serving the ones who don't know when to stand up and when to sit down. The ones who don't know the lyrics to all the songs we sing. The ones who don't own a suit or some hard bottom shoes. Real ministry means ministering to kids from the neighborhood who have ADD and ADHD and PTSD and elemental P and, and they don't know how to sit still in service because they've never been to church in their life. chip on his shoulder and is easily offended and his first response is to fight. It means minister to that brother who refuses to take his hat off because we don't see why he should have to take his hat off indoors. Real ministry is messy. Real ministry means ministering to the woman who walks in. Oh, I'm about to get in trouble now. Help me, Lord. Pray for the preacher. Real ministry means ministering to the woman who walks into the church holding hands with her girlfriend and wants to sit in the front row. Do you have enough compassion to minister or, or are you just going to go off on them and try to put them out of the very place they need to be? Or the one born as a man who's dressing like a woman but somehow came into the church.
I heard somebody say, in fact, that he's Lord of the harvest. In fact, he's the one who sowed the seeds of the harvest. Uh, I, I, I think there's a game coming on soon, so I'm going to cut off to my exit ramp. Uh, can I tell somebody today that, that he sowed the seeds when he came into this broken world to deal with all of our drama? He sowed the seeds when they rejected him and when they criticized him. He sowed the seeds when Judas betrayed him and the rest of them deserted him. He sowed the seeds when they beat him all night long and they put him on trial. He sowed the seeds when they made him carry his own cross. He sowed the seeds when they put nails in his hand. He sowed the seeds on a Friday afternoon when he hung his head and died. church who already knows the Lord, already loves the Lord, but while I'm preaching how you should reap the harvest, there may be others who are on the other side, and you're not talking about reaping no harvest, you are the harvest who needs to be reaped today, well can I tell you, if that's you, remember to reap means to work. And if you look around this room today, there's some people who are willing to work for your salvation. We can't pay for it. Jesus already did that. We can't save you. Jesus already saved you. But we're willing to put in work to make sure that you get saved. Not only that, but you know the work of a church is not just to get you saved. That's an evangelist. The work of a church is to make sure that once you get saved, you grow in discipleship. Yeah. Can I tell somebody today, that's where the work comes in. Yes. It's, it, it's one thing anybody can, can I, I'm, I'm just learning, anybody can open up the doors of the church and, and people come running down the aisle. But what happens the next day? What happens the next week? 
Yeah. What happens the next month? Yes. What happens when they ain't been yes. to church in a year, but yes. then somebody in their family yes. dies? Yes. And now they need somebody yes. to minister to them. Yes. See, this is where the work comes in. Yes. So I just got a question. If there's someone, if you have never confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that he is Lord, that means he's the head of your life. And you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. If you've never done that publicly, I want to invite you to do it today. So if there's one who wants to be saved, I want you to walk right down this aisle. Just walk right on up. Right? Just walk right up here. And let us pray with you for your salvation. Why do, why do I need to do that, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. The word tells us that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect from the pulpit to the door and back. Every one of us got issues. All of us. Some are visible issues. Some are hidden issues. But we all got issues. And I also know that the wages of sin is death. Which means those issues, those struggles that we have, they, 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 have, they have gotten us a punishment. The death penalty. We earned it by our actions. But I'm so glad that somebody else came and paid that cost. And his name is Jesus. And all he asks is that you confess, that you believe. And in your heart, that you show your belief to be true. Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He says, you shall be saved. So if that's you and you want to be saved, I want to invite you to come now. Second, perhaps you're saved, but you haven't sealed the deal with water baptism. If there's someone who wants to be baptized, it's, it's one thing to confess with your mouth. That'll get you into heaven, but, but if you want to do it the right way, that's just a temporary registration. You want to, you need a permanent license plate that says, I'm saved. And that's what baptism is. So if there's someone who's never been baptized, I want to invite you to come as a candidate for baptism. Perhaps you're saved, maybe you've even been baptized, but if you look at your life, what you believe is not matching how you live. And slowly you have strayed away from God. Maybe you're studying and praying is inconsistent. Maybe you're coming to church is inconsistent. I don't know what it is, but, but if you've fallen off track, listen, there's a, there, there's a blessing in the arms of God that remain open even when we stray away. So God is saying, come home. Come home and let's try it again. So if you want to be restored in Christian discipleship, I invite you to come now. Amen. Finally, uh, if you just don't have a church at all, if you're, if you're saved, you believe in the Lord, you pray, you have a personal relationship with Jesus, but you're not doing it in the context of church, I want to invite you to come to be a part of the church. Why do we need to be a part of the church? Because I don't know if y'all know this, but Jesus is coming back. Y'all know that, right? Y'all know Jesus is coming back, right? Amen. And when he comes back, guess what he's coming back for? He's coming back for not, not just any church. He's coming back for his church. And guess who his church is? We are. Not me. Not you. Us. He's coming back for us collectively. Which means if you want to go back with him to New Jerusalem, you need to make sure you are a part of the church. So if there's someone today who wants to be a part of the church, you can come and join the New Fellowship Church. If you're on the other side of City Hall, we'll welcome you to the Love Zion Baptist Church. If neither one of them floats your boat, listen, we know churches. I will send you somewhere, but you need to be in church. Or you can be edified, or you can be in fellowship with other believers. So if there's one for salvation, for baptism, for restoration, or to be a part of the church, if that's you, I want to invite you to come now. Is there one? Amen. Do me a quick favor before I take my seat. Look at the person next to you and ask a simple question. Say, do you need me to walk down with you? I get a yes or a no? Say, say yes, I, I need to come down. No, I'm good. If they say yes, bring them down. If they say maybe, bring them anyway. If they say no, leave them alone, all right? I don't know these South Philly folk that well, all right? Amen. Praise the Lord. There's room at the cross. Come on.